screen it from the mountains Go on and tell it to the masses That he is God there's not much hope that life is overtaking us that that our situations and our surroundings are just chaotic and and hopeless God we've heard this through the Christmas season that you came to be here with us and and sometimes it's, it's hard to remember that So we pray this morning, God, that that those of us that feel that you are far away, that we need to hear from you, God, that you would just help our hearts to be open, to be drawn to you, that you would just quiet us this morning so we could hear what you would have us hear, what you want to say to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. You can have a seat. My name is JR. I'm the teaching pastor here. And as we continue to worship, I wanted to take just a moment to call your attention to this little guy we call the Beaker Mini. Hopefully, you got one on your way in this morning. Uh, the Beaker's got stuff in it we want you to know. And particularly this morning, I, don't want to, I wanted to make sure you saw the tear off that mentions uh, the spot for prayer requests. Here at Catalyst, we, we like to pray with each other, uh, not just here this morning as we're gathered to worship, but all throughout the week. So if there's something going on in your life that you would like us to join you in prayer about, uh, as you're filling this out, write that down as well. 
and make sure that you uh, drop it in the box on your way out. If it's something that's more confidential, uh, just mark that. Go ahead and write your prayer request, but then mark it confidential, and we'll make sure that that just goes to our, our pastoral team, that they can join you as, in prayer as well. Uh, we like to tear this off all together, so we just kind of reminds us to do it. So I'm going to count to three, and we're going to tear it off. Ready? We go one, two, three. Nice. Good work. All right, kids, this is your chance to go back to the lab. Enjoy your time back there. Thank you for being in here worshiping with us. Have fun back in the lab. We'll see you afterwards. And for the rest of us, uh, at this time in our gathering, we like to offer peace to each other. We believe that peace comes into the world from God, but through the church. And so we offer each other peace in here as a way to remember that when we go out into our everyday lives, we go as agents of God's peace. So would you say hello to some people around you, welcome them, and offer them the peace that comes from God as we continue to worship. Happy New Year! Yeah, it's still New Year, right? We can still say it on the on the on the eleventh day. I mean, it's, it seems like it was just like twelve days ago that we were in 2014. It's crazy. I need to stop trying those jokes. They never work. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm not really like a New Year's person. Meaning, what I mean by that is I don't really do like the whole resolutions list, and I don't really like kind of take the time at the beginning of the year to kind of reflect on the whole last year. I do a little bit of that at like my birthday, but. I've just never been a big New Year's kind of person, but this year is a little different because as I look back at where I was a year ago from now, I was laying in my bed, covers over my head, wishing that it all would end. As some of you may know, but let me just tell you the whole story. In 2012, I got vocal nodules, which basically means I can't sing. I got spots on my vocal cords that makes it so that I'm not allowed to sing. I'll just keep tearing my voice up and won't have a voice for the rest of my life. So I was told that in 2012, and I did all the little doctor said, which included three months of no talking. And then it was like three months after that of no singing until you're like build up your strength. So I did all that. I got my voice back. I began singing at Catalyst in about September of that year. I had a great time. I was was excited. Things were going well. And then in the summer of 2013, I got vocal nodes again. No singing. Now, as those of you that know me, I, I'm, a, I'm a worship leader. I, I, I'm a pastor. So like being up front and talking uh, and, and singing is like a part of my job, but it's also, it's a big part of who I am. It's, almost, it's probably the biggest part of who I am is that I love to sing. And to have a doctor look me in the eyes and say, the way that you're doing what you love to do is making it so that you won't be able to do what you love to do for much longer. It was heartbreaking. So I did all the work again. I did everything I was told to do by the doctors. I even started vocal lessons to work on my technique to make sure that I wasn't hurting myself any more than I, than I, than I, like I was before. And I came back. And things were going well. And I thought, man, it's going good. I didn't, I didn't uh, lead every Sunday. I kind of led half the songs on Sundays. And kind of I, I worked in slowly because I thought maybe I jumped in too quickly before. So I'm trying to pace myself. I'm singing every day, doing warm-ups every day to make sure that my vocal cords are in shape and ready to work out and ready to go the big on Sunday, right? And so I'm, I'm doing good towards the end of 2013. I'm feeling good. And I go home uh, to Florida for Christmas and they asked me if I would be uh, willing to sing on their worship team. And I was like, sure, no problem. I'm, I'm good. Except after that worship gathering, I felt a little scratch in my voice that felt eerily familiar. And I spent the entire rest of our vacation 
being quiet, being silent, and whispering because I thought, what have you done? So the entire trip home, I'm beating myself up internally. The entire drive, I have my headphones in because I'm just like, I don't want to be bothered by anybody. I'm just beating myself up, beating myself up. Because I thought, why can you not get this right? Why can't you do this? So the day that we got back, it was actually the night of our, one of our teen events. We did a video game night here, and we had video game consoles set up, and it was one of the first events that Tommy was doing for us. And so, so I, just kinda, I just had to show up and be there and be kind of there for the teens and hang out and have a good time. But I wasn't feeling like having a good time, so I went off into the corner over here, and I played the game by myself because I didn't want to talk to anybody. And when the teens came up and asked me, like, what's going on? I just said, my voice. And they're like, I understand. Because they'd been on this two-year journey. So then I went to the doctor that Monday, and I was like, I feel like I hurt myself. He looks at it. Your vocal cords are good. You just have a little, like, throat infection. Great. That's awesome. I've never been so happy to have a throat infection. And that was fine, right? I mean, I should be relieved that, oh, that's all it was. Great. And that worked for about a week when after a cat row band practice on Tuesday night, the next morning I woke up and I thought, what did I do? I text Levi, I said, I'm done. I, 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 can't, I can't come to staff meeting today because I just, I have to, I'm done. I, I can't handle it right now. I'm just so over this and I don't know what to do. So I laid in my bed, covers over my head, wishing that it all would end. We got an appointment at the doctor. I went in. Your cords are fine. You're just a little sick. That's great. It should bring me relief, but I can't keep living like this. I can't keep living with the highs of, yeah, great week, awesome time. We led in worship, and it was just amazing, and it sang strong, and sang great. It was awesome. And then the next week, feeling like, oh, my goodness, what did I do? I just destroyed myself. Like, I hurt myself again. It's up, and it's down. It was not working. It was like I was in the middle of an ocean. Now, I know we don't have any oceans, I mean, we have a, like a gulf, like south of Texas. That doesn't really count. But let's, we don't have any oceans nearby. So if you can imagine, we Lake Ray Hubbard with water. And then like imagine it like times 10, times 15, times 20. I mean, the ocean is really, really huge. So like on a really, really bad day on Ray Hubbard, like the waves would be like a little blip, you know, like you'd still ride your boat, you'd still ski because like it's not really bothering you. But if you get out in the middle of the ocean, the one time I actually tried to go deep sea fishing, like we didn't even get out of the harbor before I was like blowing chunks out the back. And they had to turn around and we just fish in the sound, like the in-between, like, I was like, I'm sorry guys, I haven't got any. And that was on a normal day. So imagine with me, the middle of the ocean, no boat, no life vest, you're just flailing. That's what my life felt like a year ago. That's where I was. See, when we're in the middle of a chaotic situation, it feels like we're drowning. You can't catch your breath. And every time that you think you've got your footing, another wave comes and knocks you back over. This was one of the worst moments of my life. This was one of the worst times of my life. It felt like my life was falling apart. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had a moment like that where you just can't catch your breath? Maybe it was the loss of the job for the third time. Maybe it was the loss of a loved one. Maybe it was the fact that your marriage is struggling and you don't know how you're going to get it back to normal. Or maybe it's all three of those things. They hit one after another and you're like, I just can't catch a breath. And maybe for some of us in here, everything's normal and fine. And yet we still feel this overwhelming sense that the waves are crashing on us. It's like, it's like we're drowning in fine. And you can't explain it. That's what it feels like when chaos hits. When life beats you up like that, you begin to ask yourself a lot of questions. One of them which as being, uh, what did I do? Why is this happening? And then for those of us that follow Jesus, it's like, where is God in this? I thought you said that by Jesus coming to the earth, that that meant God is with us. Well, it doesn't feel like he's with me now feels like he's very far away. And so what we do is we, we flail, we flail, we do all the things we're supposed to do like I did with my voice. Like I just work and work and work. I do all the voice lessons. I do all the steps the doctors tell me, and I'm just flailing, just flailing, trying to make ends meet, and yet it never feels like I get any closer to where God is. 
As we've mentioned this morning, we're in the season of Epiphany. This is a season that we set aside every year to celebrate that Jesus has come to redeem the world. He's come to announce God's mission. He's come to show us what God's heart is like. He's also, this, this year it seems that he's, he's calling us to pause and reflect and hear the message of God, hear what God is saying. So we stop and we listen because we know that God is speaking. We say it every week. What is he saying? What is God saying? You might ask. Well, that's a good question. So we're going to spend the next six weeks looking at what God is saying to us. This morning, we're going to be looking at the first time God spoke in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. If you want to turn in your Bibles or, or in the app, and if you grab one of our free Bibles in the back, it's on page 1. So that's easy, right? I was worried before I got in this morning that it was going to be like page 3, and I was going to be like, oh, no, it's the beginning, page 1. Now, uh, we're also going to look at the book of Mark, which is one of the accounts of Jesus' life. We're going to look at that a little bit later. But what I want to happen this morning is I want us to be able to see how these passages are pointing us to recognize that in the middle of chaos, the middle of drowning, the middle where it feels like life just couldn't get any worse, that God is not far. He is near and speaking. And so our response needs to be that we stop and listen. So let's read this passage together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, doesn't that actually sound kind of nice? Like nice waters, you know, like God's spirit's like just hovering there. It seems really serene, right? That very thought that we have when we think of waters and we think, oh, that must be nice, shows us the the disconnect between us and the original hearers of this poem. See, for the original hearers of this passage, they, waters for them did not mean calm, did not mean serene. It meant chaos. It meant destruction. The waters, because in the waters, when you're out in the waters, at any moment a storm could come up, your ship could capsize, and you could all be dead. The waters were so scary for these old people, these ancient people, that they even personified it as like a dragon called Leviathan. They were not calm waters. So the water imagery that we find in Scripture, nearly everywhere it's used, is not imagined as calm and serene, but as destructive and chaotic. Now this creation poem was actually written while the Israelites were in captivity in Babylon, they had been ransacked so many times, they had been captured so many times, they've been enslaved so many times. This time they're in exile. They're in the middle of what seems like chaos, and they're trying to figure out, they need to, they're like, we need to tell the story again. We need to write it down. How did God begin to create? Where do they start? Right where they are. The story begins in the chaos, and then God begins to speak. What does he say? He says, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. See, in the scriptures, life begins at chaos, and then God speaks. And he separates the chaos from his order. He orders the chaos in its place, and then he names it as if it's some pet, He doesn't destroy it like we wish he would, right? Right away, he doesn't destroy it, but he puts it in its place. He names it as if it's his pet. And then in this very poetic move, the writer says, it was evening, then morning, because when there's darkness in the world, it doesn't have the final word. Morning is coming. This is the world they lived in, a world of chaos, God had spoken light, but there was still darkness, and it reared its ugly head more often than they would would have hoped. But they understood this darkness as the result of sin. They understood all of their experiences of being overtaken, of being enslaved, of being in exile as a result of their sin. Sometimes their their fallings and their chaos was a cause of, of their personal sin. Sometimes it was a national sins that they understood, but they always understood that all of this destruction, all this chaos was the result of their sin. So while they're in exile, while they're sitting in the mess that they've made, they have to figure out what is our response to be. 
going to be. Does that type of world sound familiar? A world where it seems like chaos and darkness is ruling, where they always have the final final word. Like we can't catch a break. And this world that we live in is the result, the brokenness in this world is the result of sin. It's yours, it's mine, it's theirs, it's everyone's. Heartbreak, death, disease, destruction, terrorism, evil, these are all the result of our broken world. They are all symptoms of the real issue, which is sin. So what are we supposed to do? In the face of this chaos, in the face of trying to live out this new life, this new way of life that Jesus is teaching us. How do we live that when we're living in the midst of a broken world? What is our response when that brokenness really hits close to home? I'd like us to take a look now at the book of Mark. If you want to turn in your apps or in your Bibles, and if you're using the free Bible, it's found on page 699. This is the first, this is one of the accounts of of Jesus' life written by Mark. And I find it interesting that when he begins his account of Jesus' life, he says, in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, as if he's trying to tell his early hearers and to us, like this, this in the beginning is also related to this other in the beginning, so you need to be paying attention. He then goes on to tell a prophecy about John the Baptist from the Old Testament, like talking about a man that's going to come and in the desert he's going to make a way for the Lord. And then it tells us a little bit more about what John is up to. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Now, Jesus was born into the same world that we are born into. It's a world of chaos, a world where it seems like darkness is ruling. And actually, the Israelites at this time, the people of Israel, they had not heard from God in over 400 years. They weren't in exile in some foreign land. They were actually exiles in their own land because the Romans had come over and overthrown them. And now the religion that was to connect them to Yahweh has now been overtaken by politics and corruption And it's in the midst of this chaotic world that Jesus shows up, and he's going to begin his ministry. So what does he do? What's the first thing you do when you find yourself in a world of chaos? This is what Jesus does. John's out at the Jordan River. He's actually pointing them to another story of of water, of how God provided for them. And he's calling the people of Israel to repent and be forgiven. He tells of one that will come after him, that won't just baptize them with water, but he will baptize them with God's spirit. That same spirit that hovered over the faces of the waters in Genesis is now going to hover over you. And then Jesus shows up, and he wants to be baptized. And when he's coming up out of the water, what is hovering above his head? It's God's spirit. So God's spirit shows up, and then God speaks, and he says, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. With you, I am well pleased. Sounds an awful lot like he saw that it was good. These stories are connected. So for Jesus, it seems that the proper response, when you're born into a chaotic world, in a chaotic situation, the proper response is to repent. That's what we hear here. But if Jesus is the son of God, if we believe that he has lived a sinless life, then what does he have to repent for? Exactly. What does he have to repent for? First, let me take a moment to define what we mean by repentance. Repentance is the idea of turning. So it's like you're going your own way, you're doing your own thing, you're, you're on this path, and then to repent means that you turn and you go the opposite direction. The Hebrews will also recognize this as being a return to God, a return to God. So John goes out, and he's calling to the people of Israel, return to God, return to the Jordan River. 
return to your first love. And Jesus, being born into this system, being born as a Jew, he is a part of the people that are being called to repent. So what is his response? Does he say, well, it's not my fault it ended up this way? Does he say, I'm perfect, and this is for all you other heathens and hypocrites? No, he doesn't. He participates with them in the community of repenters. He joins the community of repenting so that he will reveal to us that this is the way you respond to the chaos. Now, immediately when I read the word repent, I'm sure that many of us began going through the checklist in our mind. And you started thinking, okay, what are, what are the sins? He's going to ask me to confess my sins. What are the sins that I need to repent for? What are those things? You know, there was that, that time over there, and then there was that time with the shopping cart. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is for you. But I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that many of us in here were going through that checklist. Like, okay, he's going to ask me to repent. Let me go ahead and get started so I can get out of here quickly. Right? We go through the checklist. We go through the last week, and maybe even because it's New Year's, we've already been doing this. We're in the practice already of going through this list. What can I do different? You probably even downloaded some apps to help you follow through on your uh, road to recovery, your road to this resolution that you've made. You're going through the motion. You're trying to fix it. Like, my life was messed up. I'm trying to fix it. I'm trying to fix it. I'm trying to fix it. And you know what it all sounds like to me? What it all ends up being to me is just flailing. Your life isn't where you want it to be, and so you're just trying to figure out, how do I fix it? 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 And you just add all this stuff, and you make all these resolutions. And they're good, and it's good to, to see things, okay, I need to live a little better. That, that's fine. But if it just looks like flailing, you're not really seeing the whole picture. See, what this reminds me of, what this flailing reminds me of is, the, is this exact same thing that Jesus is doing in this passage. When you're in the middle of the ocean, or maybe even just a pool, how about that? If you're in a pool and somebody's trying to hold you under the water, what is, going to be, what is going to be your response? Flailing. I got to get my breath. I got to get my footing. I got to get out of this mess. But when someone's being baptized, what does it look like? It looks like hands across the chest. It looks like resting, waiting, stopping, stopping the flailing, and just resting into the arms of the baptizer. That's the response to chaos. The, chaos. the response to chaos is not flailing. It's stopping. It's listening. So last January, when I had that moment where laying in the bed, covers over my head, wishing that it all would end, I just didn't know what my next step was. And I went to the doctor. He said, you're fine. So I needed to I needed to go get some help because this back and forth, this roller coaster, this wave of my life was not working anymore. And so I went to a counselor and I got some help. But one of the things that he shared with me, one of the things he helped me do was to stop. He helped me figure out, he helped me figure out why are you reacting this way to this hardship? Why is it so difficult for you? And it comes down to, for me, like the reason I was getting so upset about this was that I, I felt like I had the weight of all of God's mission on my shoulders, and it was all up to me. And if I didn't have a voice to sing, that, that I wouldn't be able to be here on Catalyst, and I wouldn't be able to do what I, what I was supposed to do. And I'm letting all these people down. I'm letting my wife down. I'm letting my friends down. And so all of that weight was on my shoulders. So in the counseling sessions, I was able to stop and recognize and just listen. Listen to God's voice. And what I figured out was that through the help of the counselor and through his, his pointing me to God, is that all God has asked me to do is to do what I'm able to do. And anything outside of that is out of your control. So you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about what everybody else thinks. You don't have to worry about how you're going to provide. God, you're going to, you'll figure it out. You don't need to be stressing about all that. So a few weeks ago, I was actually traveling to China and um, that Monday, I, I woke up, and I began singing to get warmed up for our, for our uh, working with the students over there, and I felt a little scratch in my voice that felt eerily familiar, and so I'm texting Megan, and it's like 14-hour difference, so I hope she was not asleep or something. I'm texting Megan, I'm like, I don't think I can sing. I think I've got a node. I think I've done it again. 
I text JR, like, hey, I'm, I'm taking the proper steps. I'm going to have Megan lead because I don't know if I'm going to have a voice when I get back. And I had Megan, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a, across the world. I can't get to the doctor. I actually tried to go to the pharmacy, and it was bad. <laughs> so I'm there, and, and I don't have any, it's out of my control. I can't do anything. So what was my response this time? Because of the work that God has been doing in my life, because of all the help that I got before, I did not lay in my bed with the covers over my head wishing it all would end. I said, you know what? I'm going to enjoy my time here, and if I don't have a voice by Sunday, it's going to be taken care of, and we'll take the proper steps to make it happen. Like, I, just do what you got to do. And by the end of the week, like, my voice is back, and it was fine, and I'm so thankful that I didn't just get in my head about it. I didn't just start flailing around. I actually took a moment. I said, you know what? I'm just going to trust. I'm just going to stop and listen. I had to stop and listen. And I realized in that moment that God hadn't left me, that he was near and he was speaking. While I was trying to flail around before, this time I realized that he's right there. He's near and he is speaking. Because God's spirit hovered over the face of the deep. And God's spirit descended on him like a dove. I know that it seems that our world is a chaotic mess. It seems that chaos and darkness is winning. This morning, I feel like we should take a cue from Jesus. And we should join the community of returners. There are times, of course, where we do need to stop and take an account of what we've been doing and figure out is there things we need to change because some chaos is our own making. But there's also just many times where the chaos of our life is just the result of living in this broken world. So we just need to be reminded that that's where the story begins, not where it ends. So I want to invite us, Catalyst, to return to God 2013 was a, a lot of change. Some may see it as just chaos. It was a lot of things happening at our church. And so I feel like it's fitting for us to begin this year, to take a time to stop and listen because God is near. and He is speaking. I don't know what repentance looks like for you. I don't know what returning looks like for you. That's going to be something that you and God will need to work out just in your time with him. So you got to start thinking, what does stopping look like? What does flailing look like? And so we're going to take some time this morning to do that. But as you leave, there's, there's a pamphlet on the table out there, and they may be handing them out as you're leaving. But we, we put together a little pamphlet called the, the Guide to Spiritual Practices for Catalyst. And there's just five practices in there. It gives, tells you what the practice is, and then it actually gives you step-by-step instructions. All right, here's how you, here's how you do this. Here's how you read your Bible. Here's a way to read the Bible so that you can stop and listen to what God might be saying to you through the scriptures. Here's the way that you give. Here's the way that you take Sabbath. This is the way you rest from your work. So there's five over there. There's five in the pamphlet. And we want you to not take this pamphlet home and then get in your flailing mode and say, okay, I better start doing, I better start doing, I better start doing. No, 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 no. This pamphlet is a guide for you to be able to stop and listen. I'm going to end this message today with a prayer of examine. We've been doing these the last few months. And what I've found is that it's very, it's very meaningful for me as we do these because it takes a chance. Like I'm hearing the scripture, I'm hearing it taught, and then immediately I'm asked to think, okay, what is, this, what is God saying to me in this moment? After hearing all of this, what is God saying to me? And I can really take that time to stop and listen right here and right now. So I'm going to have them on the screen. If you want to read along with me, you can. If you want to close your eyes and just hear the questions, that's fine. We're going to take a few moments here and let you think on these answers. When in the last year did I have moments of chaos? What does my flailing look like? When in the next year might my life get chaotic? And what does stopping look like?
Let's pray. God, we are so thankful that you have spoken and that you still speak. I believe that you have spoken to us today through your scriptures. But it's so easy for us when life gets chaotic to just flail around and do more and work harder and try to fix everything. So I pray that as we begin this year that we would take seriously this reminder to repent, to return, to stop and to listen, to stop the flailing. Because when chaos hits, you are not far off. You are near and are speaking to us. May these practices that we've laid out in this pamphlet, may they be for us empowering and life-giving. I pray that it would not give us more ways to flail and more things to do, but it would just be a way that we could stop and listen to you. As we read the scripture, may it not be a task that we check off a list, but a time where we truly can reflect on what you are saying to us through these ancient words. As we pray this year, may we not just spout off our requests, but may we take time to really listen, to really seek what you would have us do in our lives. As we fast this year, may it be something that we May it not be something that we just dread because it's, it's that time of year again, but may it be for us a reminder that just as our stomach aches for you when we do not eat, our lives are aching for you. As we work this year, I pray that we would not just go, go, go without stopping, but that we would allow the practice of Sabbath practice of rest to be an integral part of our weekly, monthly, and daily lives. And as we give this year, may it not just be something that we are, give our 10% to get you off our back, but maybe something that energizes us to become more generous people because you have been so generous to us. Not just in giving to the church, not just giving our money, but God, the way that we give all of our resources to, to bring your kingdom to earth. God, help us. This is our goal, God. This is our prayer, that you would speak and that we would listen and then we would be obedient. We pray all this in your son's name. Would you stand with us as we sing together?
Once again, once again, just want to say we're so glad that you guys take the time to be with us on Sunday mornings. And if you're a guest with us today, we know it's kind of difficult to, to maybe get connected and find some people that you can like get to be friends with and get connected at a church. And so we've made this thing for you called Newcomer's Lunch. And it's happening today, right now, after this. And we just invite you to stick around. If you want to know a little bit more about Catalyst, we'll uh, be about 45 minutes. We'll have you hopefully home before halftime, okay? And uh, you can catch the rest of the game. But if you want to know how, what, it, uh, what Catalyst is, how, a little bit of our history, and know how you can get plugged in and get to know people, that's what this lunch is for you, all right? For the rest of us, for everybody, for Catalyst, I pray that we, may we be a church that when chaos hits, when change comes, that we don't flail around, we don't just get busy just to show how religious we are, but that we stop and we listen and we recognize that God is near and he is speaking and he will change us from the inside out. Go in his grace and his peace. We'll see you guys next week.